Um, does anybody have a question? Okay, over here. Oh, if nobody has a question right now, I have the, the <laughs> moderator's privilege to ask the first couple of questions. Um, Dr. Stewart, uh, you mentioned that um, there was another um, uh, pathway or another, um, what am I looking for? Uh, well, basically the SOX3, uh, but you didn't tell, talk much about that and really interesting that Murray talked about SOX11. Could you talk about the, um, the work that's been done in combining P10 along with SOX3? Sure. I'm going to stand up just because I can't see this side of the room if I'm sitting. So, um, <clears throat> again, just to go back to the, um, uh, uh, the pipeline here, and, and um, uh, Dr. Blackmore really talked about this very elegantly, how you, how you start with screening experiments and, and then move into the much more difficult spinal cord injury experiments. So, again, uh, Jigong He uh, at uh, Children's Hospital Harvard has continued to uh, test different uh, interventions, different uh, molecular targets, and the next one on the list is SOX3. And the track on this is very much like what uh, has already happened with, uh, with P10. So he used the optic nerve example and showed that SOX3 deletion also promotes axon regeneration. And now I need to just say a little bit about the two different pathways. So P10 actually operates at the signaling end of things and regulates the synthesis of proteins that are critical for growth. SOX3 operates at a different level, and, and again, going to Dr. Blackmore's talk, so DNA makes RNA, RNA encodes for protein. Um, SOX3 actually seems to be regulating the transcription of particular RNAs. So when you manipulate SOX3, you boost up RNA production, when you manipulate P10, you boost up the translation of those RNAs. So it's actually a double intervention to accomplish the same thing to achieve regeneration. So again, using the screening approach, Dr. He has already shown that the combined intervention, deleting SOX3 and P10, amplifies regeneration in the optic nerve setting by about tenfold. And so obviously we're all gearing up to do that experiment in spinal cord injury. And again, we start with genetically modified mice. The unfortunate thing about mice is that they can only be created by breeding them. And uh, so that, that this does take a little time. We, we, uh, we do try to encourage that in our lab, uh, you know, play music and so forth. And uh, the guys are great at, uh, at uh, uh, getting this process going as quickly as possible. So we actually do have the animals uh, and we're just in the process of generating enough of them to do our first spinal cord injury experiment, which we hope to be able to launch in a couple of months. Uh, I just want to, for the people who are paralyzed in the room to get the, the importance of what was just said. Right now, they can regenerate axons two to three vertebral segments, but if you can re regenerate them 10 times that distance, the, whole, the human spinal cord is 30 segments long, so we really have a possibility of long distance regeneration with the combination of those two factors. Um, I'm, I'd like to ask a question of Dr. Murray if nobody else is, has a question yet. Um, um, Dr. Murray, you know, recently we had, there was a, um, a tremendous um, large project that was uh, completed uh, 400 labs over a period of seven years, the ENCODE project. And the, and the essence of that project was that um, the, what was previously thought to be junk DNA in the, in, the, in, the, in the genome was found to have actually all these genetic switches that would turn on genes throughout the, um, throughout the rest of the, uh, the genome. Is it possible that we could get information from that project that would, are, are there switches in a, somewhere, in other words, in, in the uh, genome that might actually turn on these regeneration genes? Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a great question. Because um, I, I kind of told a, a fib in the talk. So I, I laid out this really simple DNA to RNA to protein. Turns out that that's the minority case. The vast majority of RNA that's made in the cell doesn't get made into protein. And this is just now coming into focus. 
And so the mystery is, what is all that RNA doing? Um, it's, it's, it's certainly not junk. Um, and so it turns out it's having all these really interesting functions in the cell um, to, you know, all these, all these complex layers of regulation mediated by the RNA. The reason that's so important is because it's what I brought up at the very end, this RNA-seq technology. Um, what it does is it gives you um, the sequence of every single RNA um, in the cell, in, you know, those that make protein and those that don't make protein. So for the first time, um, we're getting this, this insight into this sea of, of all this RNA floating around in the cell. Um, so whether the, the ENCODE project in specifically will, will lead the way forward, I'm not sure, but what I think would be really interesting would be to take an RNA-seq approach to comparing regenerating and non-regenerating neurons, and don't just focus on the proteins, which is what I've been doing so far, but to actually focus on this, this mysterious sea of RNA um, and ask whether maybe it's a difference at, at that level that also contributes to axon success or, or failure. Is that? Thank you. Oh, I have a question. Is oh, it, Jerry Silver has a question. Is this on? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you. So it's really exciting, you know, from the two talks that you're starting to show functional recovery uh, in, in critical animal models after injury. So I think that's important for the audience to know. It's actually the first time I've seen that, so I'm really excited about that. Um, just a specific question to Oz. Um, you, you showed really nice recovery. Can you talk a little bit about the lesion itself that you were using? Mm -hmm. a and can you talk about what I thought I saw on the slide was that in the P10 only knockout, I wasn't seeing much recovery, mm -hmm. but when you added fibrin uh, to that, whatever model this is, you did see recovery. Can you just talk a little bit about f fibrin itself, what's going on without P10? So it's about two or three questions. Sure. Um, understanding that I'm uh, standing between uh, you and the, the break at 9.45 and we're already over, I'll try to do it quickly. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. The, um, the group that got both fibrin in the lesion site and, and P10 deletion were the only ones that showed improvement. And, and we do think that that really uh, indicates that P10 alone uh, deletion, at least in the rat setting, is, is not perhaps going to be uh, as... Uh, functionally dramatic as, as we might have uh, hoped. It doesn't mean that it won't have any effect by itself, but we do think that we've still got to do something with the lesion site. Um, number two, the lesion here was actually at the cervical level. So just to say, um, for those of you who don't do animal research, um, we, we, we want to do our studies using cervical level injuries because that is the most common level of injury. It is the one that we can most easily study the function of the corticospinal tract in. Um, but you can't do a complete lesion at the cervical level in a mouse or a rat because it's just too damaging to the animal and they, it, it really isn't something that, that a, a mouse or a rat can, can survive uh, without such severe complications that we just really can't do it. So these are partial injuries. The partial injury that we did was exactly the one that, uh, that Dr. Blackmore meant, uh, mentioned, which was the dorsal hemisection, which cuts um, almost all of the corticospinal tract that descends in the dorsal column. In the rat, that still causes the same kind of a cavitation lesion that you get with a contusion or uh, any other kind of injury in, in, in people. So it is a, uh, still a, a lesion that generates this huge uh, cavity in the, in the area of the injury site. And I think I forgot question number three, but that's okay. <laughs> fibrin. Oh, what about the fibrin? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so fibrin is the same thing that you use surgically. It's, it's a glue. And the, uh, the difference is that in the case of the experiments done here, uh, they used a glue, this glue that was derived from salmon instead of, of people, human fibrin uh, versus uh, fish fibrin. And it turns out that fish fibrin just has a ton of different properties. And there's, it's a long discussion. Maybe I'll just leave that to Kelly and Gail to talk about later on. But it does have some fundamentally different properties and also has some different properties in terms of its ability to just solidify in the, in the injured spinal cord, just physical differences. Are there any other questions? Okay, yes. Um, is that on? Okay. That's, uh, yeah, very excited to hear what you've both talked about this morning. And also very curious to understand a little more, I mean, since you've been working with mice, 
what is a pathway from moving from mice to humans uh, in terms of, you know, are uh, the same or similar genes going to be involved, do you expect from other research, or how, how do you see that, you know, looking out, I don't know, however many years, how do you see that uh, pathway, that roadway or whatever it is, uh, laying out? Do you want to take it, Murray? Go ahead, Doug. So the question is how to, how to move a gene treatment from a, from a rodent to a human. Um, I, I'll, I'll tackle that from the science side. I'll just emphasize that um, these pathways that we're intervening in, the, the P10 and these KLF transcription factors, these are ancient and conserved. Um, so flies have KLF transcription factors that are almost identical to ours. Um, which is almost identical to the mouse. So I think on scientific grounds, there's, there's reason for optimism um, in these particular cases, that the, that the gene function in an animal would be um, conserved in a human just because, because they're so conserved. The, the nuts and bolts of, of how, do you, how do you go from having a, a virus in a lab that's helping a, a mouse recover to, to, to getting that into a human, um, I'm, I'm going to defer on that. I think that there's people here that are, that are much better qualified to, to talk about the finances and the economics and the, the nuts and bolts of doing that. Fair enough. Okay. Wait, okay. Uh, Martin has a question here. Wait, wait. Why don't you wait for the mic? Is this working? There we go. Yeah. Okay, so um, you guys are broadly speaking working in a similar general area of the technology, you know, to deliver kind of regeneration here. Um, how much do you guys actually, you know, talk or how much does the field talk together about these things? And um, who is, I suppose, overseeing that whole thing? Is it a committee? Is it through the neuroscience organizations or is it through the funding organizations that, that, that talk together? I mean, who's in charge of this? Oh, so why don't you take that one? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I mean... That, that's what I thought. Yeah. And, and that's a problem. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, uh, just to say, we, we, we are working in very similar areas. We, we talk when we are at meetings together. Uh, and, you know, the great thing about meetings like this is it gives us a chance to kind of catch up on each other's work. But there's nobody actually, you know, guiding the ship here. Um, and, and the reason is that to guide the ship really requires a huge amount of funding. Um, we are all struggling in our different ways to try to just float our labs. Um, NIH is obviously uh, in a uh, bad situation. The funding is going to go down one way or the other, and uh, it will go down different levels depending on whether the sequestration goes through or whether the Congress works together to cut the budget anyway. And I'm not even sure which is going to be the worst. But to put it together requires money, and there hasn't been the kind of organization with a sufficient amount of money to really say, okay, we want, we want to bring you guys together. We want you to do, you know. I understand that funding is a key part of Mm -hmm. And you say it takes money, but... You, you know, it absolutely takes, you know, a very large amounts of money, but very large amounts of money gets spent on this. It doesn't seem to me that it's incredibly efficient use of the resources, given that every discrete group is competing for that money from NIH, from the other, you know, philanthropic fan or funding organizations. So that's just a comment I'd like to, to leave there. That you know, we need that guide, we need someone guiding the ship, you know, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. SCI regeneration ship globally. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, can I, yeah. And it, it, it is about money, but um, money at the end of the day is only an enabler. Um, and, and if you build it, they will come. If you have that ship that's not a Titanic, that's actually going somewhere and not going to crash into some big problem, 
Um, I think that the money will come from the, 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 the global community, so to speak. So that's just a comment there that it's, it's something that we as a community need to, to focus on that. Who is guiding this ship? Who's in air traffic control for this whole, whole project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good, good comment. There's another one right behind. Okay, John O'Connor. Wait, 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 John, wait for the mic. In the same vein. Hold it up closer. In the same vein, I've seen uh, a situation. Okay. I've seen a situation recently when a company using a matrix bridge, uh, basically through NASA program, uh, using nanotechnology, uh, was funded 18 million plus by a hedge fund because of the scientists, not because of the board of directors, not because of their advertising, but they looked beyond it and they saw Langer and uh, Osmond Stewart, they saw the scientists with good data and they said, yeah, we'll give that $18.5 million to start that fledging company. Is it time now to all the scientists to get together and I'm not saying you create a Ford Motor Company or a uh, Edison Corporation where you get Tesla and everybody get involved and create uh, a new way of generating power across the uh, new world, electricity. But I mean, if you did have something like that, the scientists have the capacity with their knowledge to maybe get I'm not saying hedge funds or whatever, but to get enough money together to do all the experiments you want, young man, to do everything we need, and to go and have a complete cure. And Bob, you're the perfect guy to go and put something like that together. I mean, is it, is it, is it something that United to Fight can, can go and spearhead with yourself? I know the money's out there. I know that friends of mine, with inside of a week, gave $18.5 million because of everybody's research. That information was given to these hedge fund uh, entrepreneurial people, a lot of them from Goldman Sachs, and they gave that money willingly right away. And that money's out there. Obviously, they want to see a profit, but that's how this country's been built. So I wonder if all the doctors, Dr. Wise, Young, all of them can't get together and get tremendous funding somehow through a, a common le leadership role. And, um, you know, I wonder if you guys should start talking together. Rather than looking for the NIH and everybody give you pennies, I wonder if it's time to step up and say, maybe together, uh, united, united to fight paralysis, you guys can go and get the proper funding. Because I know there's a lot of people out there with a lot of money that would like to fight a good fight. Thank you. I would um, just briefly answer myself to say, um, and then we're going to have to cut this off, and I'll say that we, do, we will have uh, time for more questions in the breakout sessions that are coming up uh, later this morning. But I think this research is still at a basic research level, and uh, what Oz described is like possibly how to move into translational research. Um, the biotechnology world is way different now than it was. 15 years ago, 15 years ago, there would have been millions of dollars pouring into this research now. Investors are much more savvy now and uh, more cautious. And, it, um, and they even call um, the area of research that Oz is coming into the valley of death, where a lot of uh, uh, things die for lack of money like this. Um, but um, I just want to close the session right now. Uh, well, no, wait, we're, we're going to have a breakout session where all the, all, uh, Dr. Murray and Dr. Stewart uh, will be in a, a smaller setting, and, and, and people can ask all the questions that they want. But just for the sake of time, we have to cut it off right now. But I, I just want to close by saying that um, I've been to you know, maybe 100 conferences like this in my 31 years of spinal cord injury. And what we just saw are two researchers who are regenerating the cortical spinal tract which is the one that controls movement in spinal cord injury. It, for me, it's just almost surreal to be here and hear this. But I uh, just want you um, both to uh, give a, a round of applause to these both scientists. <laughs>